Church. Hope you're all well this morning. Morning, Jenny. Morning, Alan. Does anybody know what day it is today? Sunday. <laughs> Does anybody know what other day it is today? Full points, A star to Eileen. Not gonna happen. Today. Ah, uh, if you're at the nine. Cheers. <laughs> Um, so yes, today is the day of Pentecost and um, before service we were just chatting and actually Tim had said we should celebrate this day just as we celebrate Christmas. 
And I had never thought about that before, and I thought, gee, because we actually should, because this is the day that the Holy Spirit was given to us as a gift. Obviously not today, but like this is the mm -hmm. day that we celebrate. Yeah. So I'm going to read this morning from <coughs> Acts 1. Um, uh, the, this is after Jesus has obviously um, been uh, crucified, and he has spent 40 days appearing to different people um, before he ascends back up to heaven. So they gathered around him one morning and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in all of glasses. Jerusalem and in Judea, Samara, and to the ends of the earth. So Lord, I just want to thank you, Father, for the gift that you have given us in the Holy Spirit. Lord, everything that we do um, is powered by the Holy Spirit, Father. So we just ask that this morning we would just all be so sensitive to the Spirit this morning. That the Spirit would just move freely amongst us, within us, and all around us. Lord, be glorified this morning. In Jesus' name. Holy
you're so worthy this morning. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever sing. We live for you. Jesus, the 
So God, we thank you that you made the way. We thank you that you are the way. And we thank you that you've given us the way. Thank you, God, that you sent your Son from heaven to earth to die on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, that you lived a perfect life to become the perfect sacrifice. The Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're constantly pointing us to these truths. That you're constantly pointing us to, to heaven. thank you that you give us the power to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received. We thank you that you fill us with patience and joy, self-control, <coughs> gentleness, kindness, humility. And I pray, God, that you would help us to bear fruit looks like your son, that tastes like your son, that smells like your son. So Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're here with us. Jesus, we thank you that you you walk the, the earth for us. And Father God, we thank you that you have the, the vision to see it and the power to make it happen. And all God's people this morning said amen. 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 Let's give it up for our worship team this morning, guys. Yeah. Hey, it is so good to be with you this morning. I am absolutely delighted that we are back and that we are in Oma today. We are going to release the kids out into their um, zone this morning. Connect kids, we love you. And um, we pray Woo! God's blessings Woo! over you this morning as you go and engage with, with God's words. Hey, massive thank you to everyone. I promise I'll make eye contact in a moment. Massive thank you to everyone who generously gave into our special offering last week as part of our desire to see our Connect Kids space upstairs habitable Aoife, would you come and help me for a sec, please? <laughs> while, I, um, while, while I do this, thank you so much, thank you. Um, you guys are so generous. Um, I know that some um, of you gave last week, some people have given this week, and so we'll bring you a figure um, over the next week or so, just to let you know how much, how much we've left it. Alan, thank you for last week's message on, on tithing. It was uh, greatly encouraging. And I'm confident that none of us felt um, condemned uh, from the message that you gave. And so, hey, look, if you are an online giver, a regular giver here at the church, thank you. If you are giving in person, we have got envelopes scattered around over here on our um, information shelf and an offering box uh, as you exit the building. So if you'd like to give into that, um, we're always so, so grateful. The Heart of Oma Community Church is one of, of generosity, and you guys are just so, so, so generous. It's actually a joy to be part of a community that is so generous and constantly punching above its weight, I might add. Um, the, the money that comes in with the limited number of people we have in the room never ceases to amaze. Um, it's quite extraordinary, actually. It's great. And hey, Next week, it's the 11th of June, next Saturday, isn't it? Yes, Alan is um, going to be running um, a 5K. 10, 10, 10. 10K, sorry. Which Alan? You just off your phone. You? Which Alan? Sorry, Alan. Alan Wilson. Please forgive me, Mr. Wilson. And um, he's going to be running a, a 10K next week, but for the rest of you, um, we're going to be here in the building. And uh, we're going to have a work day where, as you know, our heart and desire is to get some work completed upstairs. I would like to see some of these tiles replaced, some painting touch stuff and different things like that. But primarily, um, we're going to focus our efforts and our attention into upstairs so that we can be one step closer to getting that kid's space 
usable, workable, and um, I'm just so excited. The heart of our church is the Reza generation, and uh, we're building from the ground up, quite literally, and you know, our primary area of focus is children's ministry. And uh, I think Brian, someone will say that the last time that he was here, that when a church makes um, children's ministry a priority, the church has longevity um, and a legacy that lasts way beyond the years of those who are currently in the room. So please come along for that. Alan, what time do you think we should be here? 8.30. 8.30. Okay, Alan, Alan, realistically, what time should we be here for? 10 o'clock. Okay, so we're going to start work at, at 10 o'clock and then... Um, Alan Wilson, when you're finished with 10K, you can come over and join us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that at all. Anyway, sorry, for those of you who are joining us online this morning, sorry for all the in-house jokes. We are equally as glad and delighted that you're here with us this morning. And uh, I'm really, I'm excited for this morning's message. And um, I really hope and pray that this message will bring life and love and hope to, to the heart of your world. It's an I am message and for those of you who are joining us online for the first time or new to the room kelly we have been looking together at um, ephesians chapter one and pulling out a couple of life-changing statements that i have coined the great i ams we know that jesus is the great i am and he made a number of statements um, about himself and, and his identity and who he was and, and god and in my own personal walk and journey with God, I have discovered that in the reading of God's word, that there's a couple of things that have jumped out at me um, that I have coined the great I am's that have allowed me to see myself as God sees me, to embrace life in Christ at a, at a, at a new level. And so I'll read to you, if it's okay, this morning from Ephesians chapter 1. I'll read a couple of verses. And then hopefully then this morning as I am forgiven and hopefully you'll be encouraged as we journey through these thoughts this morning. I want to say this just from the outset if it's okay and I really should have said this weeks ago that this collection of talks, this series of messages is more testimonial than theological and more story based than theology based and I'm really hoping that out of my testimony that your theology would be transformed and out of my testimony of what God has been doing in the Shields family's life and in our lives as, as a church together that it would help shape and reshape your theology of God and so whilst it's highly testimonial um, there's also a deep theological kind of current running through it as well so anyway it says in Ephesians chapter 1 uh, verse 3 and we'll go through to, to 14 praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Everybody say every. Every. Wonderful. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. My phone has frozen. Please forgive me. In order, here I'll read that last verse again. Having been predestined, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out in everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were first put to 
put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory, and you were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Say glory. 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 And so, Paul is essentially, let me just put this down for a second. I feel like I'm falling apart this morning. Just give me a, bear with me, okay? Talk among yourselves just for a moment. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Now, talk among yourselves for a sec. Tell everyone how much you enjoyed this lunch yesterday. As you were, okay. So, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. If you are unfamiliar, um of where Ephesus is. I know Alan pulled up some great maps last week to help you understand where the tribes of Israel were, but Ephesus is essentially just a little bit northeast of um, Izmir in Turkey. I had the um, privilege of visiting um, it uh, a number of years ago when I was away on international competition. So anyway, he's writing to, to this part of the world to encourage them in their faith. He's reminding them of everything that they have been given through faith in Jesus Christ. He's reminding them that they have been given every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus through their faith in him. And so over the last couple of weeks, you'll, if you've been with us, you'll remember that in the first talk that we, that we looked at was, I am chosen. And I said that in spite of everything that God knew that we were going to do and not do, where we were going to go and, and not go, literally everything that he knew about us, that he still chose to make us, that he still chose to save us, that he still chooses to partner with us and has chosen to spend eternity with us. And that has nothing to do with what we have done and everything to do with what he decided and what Christ made available to us through his life, death, resurrection and ascension to heaven. And then the next week we looked at it and I said, I am saved. And we looked at how we are saved from the penalty of sin, we are being saved from the power of sin and will be saved from the presence of sin. And then we looked at, I am a child of God, and we looked at how before the world began, God made the decision to adopt us into his family. And as his adopted children, adopted through a process, which was the blood of Jesus Christ, the adoption papers were signed by the blood of Jesus Christ, that actually were positioned into his loving family and everything that we need to thrive is actually made available to us as his children. And we can approach his throne of grace with the confidence of Abba Father. We can literally, without sounding disrespectful to the sovereignty of God, sit on his knee, tickle his chin, and say, hey, big man, that's a crack. That's the level of intimacy that is available to us as the children of God. And it's a beautiful thing to think that God's deepest desire is that we would know him as deeply as he knows us and love him as intimately as he loves us. And it's this beautiful thing that as his children, his adopted children, that we get to enter into that and we can live from a place of rest as, as a result of that. And so this morning, as I've already alluded to, we're going to look at this whole idea of being forgiven. And the statement for today is, I am forgiven. And I want to say this from the start. I'm going to tell a story, okay? And as I tell the story, somebody in the Shields family is going to be um, projected in, in poor light. And I just want to say this from the outset, okay? that, um, and we will get to this, I was not without fault. So as we're going through the story, just remember that, that I was not without fault, okay? But as the story transforms, before we get to it, it may actually think that Jenny's the worst person that ever lived. Never. Ever, ever lived. And she's not, she's beautiful and she's wonderful, and I was not without fault, okay? So anyway, so when Jenny and I met and we went on this whirlwind romance, <laughs> and uh, uh, some, you know, uh, some people uh, meet people, and it really is a whirlwind of romance. And then other people enter into a tornado of torture. For a while, it kind of felt that it was a whirlwind romance, and then it became a tornado of torture, all very, very quickly. But during our um, wild romance stage, the twins were born, and we both inside of us knew without a shadow of a doubt that we were made for more, that the lives that we were living were not the lives that we wanted to live. 
we were heavily in involved in, in substance misuse and, and all of those things. And so we, after a wonderful invitation from Jenny's father, we decided that we would pack up our lives in Dublin and that we would relocate to, to Liverpool. Jenny's dad was phenomenal in all of this. He was really generous. He loaned us the deposit to buy our first house. And um, he gave me a job so that I could pay the mortgage. And, uh, and I worked with him, and it was really a, it was the fresh start that we were hoping for, I think that's fair to say. We were in England for a while, and things were evolving, is probably a, a good word to say it. And um, we certainly were feeling a lot more settled. Um, and then something happened, and well, not something happened. Jenny's mum took very, very ill. Jenny's mum died. And when Jenny returned, she was quite low, quite sad, quite broken. And I had just been involved in a motorbike accident and was in no fit state to care for her. And so in her desire to be cared for, she sought another relationship with uh, my best friend. And she had an affair, she fell pregnant, she attempted suicide, and uh, we basically split up as a, as a result of it. And it was a really, really difficult time for us. And whenever we came back to, to Northern Ireland, I rented a house, okay? Now, God love Brian Somerville, because when I returned to Northern Ireland, the house that I rented for me and the twins to live in, because when we split up, I brought the twins back, Jenny went to live with her aunt, and I lived as a, a single parent for a while, and the defunctions of that with the support of my parents, and then Jenny's input um, on a semi-regular basis. But I rented a house from Brian Somerville, and I paid him six months rent in advance, because I had the best of intentions. And at the end of the, the six months, Brian started chasing me for more rent, and then he was chasing me for more rent, and then he was chasing me for more rent, and then he was chasing me for more rent. And it got to the point where actually I was evicted um, from the property. Imagine Brian Somerville evicted me, and I'm a good Christian man. Uh -huh. Imagine that, the cheek of him. And um, so he evicted me, and it made me homeless basically with my children. Shame on him. And um, you all know I'm joking, of course, when I say that. Um, so. With that then, um, I, I moved in with my parents, but not long after Brian had evicted me, he became the senior pastor of Cornerstone City Church in Derry. I wasn't saved at this point, okay? Started going to church, then Jenna got saved. Um, by saved, we mean she entered into a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ and chose to, to follow him. And through Jenny's life-changing, miraculous transformation, I decided that I too would want to have a similar relationship with God because I could see what he was doing in her life and I wanted him to do it in my own life as well. And so as this is going on, um, we're going to Cornerstone and Brian is the pastor. And every time that I would see Brian come, okay, we were meeting in the Calga Centre in Derry. If I saw Brian coming, I would either drop my head and hide and pretend that I was doing something. You know how you do it when you want to ignore somebody? You, you all know what I'm talking about. Don't look at me like you don't, uh, because you've all done it. You've all been there. Uh, and so anyway, so you, you either walk to the other side of the road, you turn around and you walk in the opposite direction, or in the 21st century, you pretend you're on your phone. And maybe that's, am I giving all my secrets away here? And, um, and that's, so anyway, so every time that I would see Brian, this is what would happen, okay? And it got to the point where I was kind of like, I actually really like coming to this church. And I love the people here, and it feels like family. They feel like a great community of people. But every time I see this man, I'm filled with guilt, I'm filled with shame, and it's actually really impacted my ability to feel safe in this community and safe in this environment. So I thought to myself, I need to do something about this. I need to put my big boy pants on, I need to pull up my socks, and I need to do something about it. So I remember I rang Brian to the church office, and I'm like, hey, big man. How is she cutting the day? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I said, hey, any chance we could meet up for a coffee? So he said, of course, would love to hang out with you. And I'm like, bleh, vomit in my mouth moment. Why didn't you say no? Oh, I'm going to have to do this. So we went to a coffee shop in Derry on Spencer Road, in Waterside in Derry. Sub London Derry, Maiden City, whatever. And um, we were sitting there, and I just looked at him and I said, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm, I just wanted to say, love the church, love the community, love the family, but I've got a real stumbling block, and it's you. And he's kind of, eh. and I'm like, here's the thing. 
I just need to apologize for the way I treated your business, for the way that I disrespected you, for the way that I behaved in the environment that you had given us, because we really wanted to make our, that house our home, but circumstances just dictated at the time because of poor choices and bad behavior that we couldn't thrive in, in, in that environment. And Brian, he responded in the most beautiful way. And he just reminded me of two things. And the first thing was this. He says, you know that God's forgiven you? And as an ambassador of Christ, I've forgiven you too. And then he went on to say this. And this is the thing that has struck with me for, for all of my days with Brian Somerville. The good, the bad, and the ugly, the highs, and, and the lows. And he said this. He says, his desires for me matched God's. And that he just wanted me to thrive. And then what he did was this. He says, are you in a home group? connect group, life group, whatever you want to call them. And um, I was like, no, what's one of those? And he said, come to my house tonight. And when you come to my house tonight, you'll see. And what he did was this, is that he invited me into his home that evening, and he planted me into the heart of the church because he forgave me, and our relationship was restored. And this is when Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, and he says that God is so rich in kindness and grace and he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and he forgave our sins. It's this beautiful thing that there's restoration in the relationship that is available to us because of what Christ did on the cross. But I think you'll all agree with me. I don't think there's anybody in the room that will um, disagree with this, but if you do, we can chat about it later. Accepting forgiveness is a really difficult thing to do. And I find in my research and in my conversations and in my um, questioning of other people that the reason that we find it so difficult to accept forgiveness is because we lack the compassion, the humility, and the patience to forgive ourselves. And because we lack the compassion and the humility and the patience to forgive ourselves, we really find forgiveness a challenge which makes it an even greater challenge then for us to forgive other people. And so what happens is this, is that because we have this warped sense of understanding around forgiveness, that it actually has a massive impact on our relationship with God as well. And because we, we've been told that we are forgiven, we all know it. We all have a, a head knowledge of being forgiven. But yet many of us are still carrying the guilt the shame and the remorse of our past sins and what they're actually doing is that they're preventing our ability or enabling our inability to forgive ourselves and what that does is that it then impacts our ability to connect to God and when we carry shame and when we carry guilt and when we carry remorse what it actually does is that it actually leads us into isolation and forgiveness does the opposite it brings us into relationship through the process of, of restoration. So some of you will have been in the Helix in 2018 for our movement conference. I know that Eileen was there and um, I had the privilege of um, being one of the keynote speakers. You guys were there as well. I had the privilege of being one of the keynote speakers at the movement conference that year. And, and the Helix, if you're unfamiliar with the Helix, the Helix is one of Ireland's, this is straight from Wikipedia by the way, the Helix is one of uh, Ireland's premier entertainment venues and it happens to be the venue in which the telephone, television programme The Voice Ireland is filmed and, and recorded. And so The Voice, if you're unfamiliar with The Voice, again, straight from Wikipedia, is a reality TV singing program in which contestants come on the stage to sing to judges who have their backs turned to them. And what happens is that the judges sit in high-backed red chairs, and should they like the sound of the voice of the contestant, they then compress a button that will turn their chair around and signal to the contestant that they have been accepted. And I'll remember the day that I was going out onto the stage um, to preach my message for the first time. And I, I tried to put myself in the position of somebody who would have been on The Voice. Because the thing about it is, is that whenever the contestants leave the dressing room and as they walk to the stage to do their performance and, and during 
the performance, they must have some severe anxiety going on. Because they're actually wondering if their performance is going to be good enough for them to be accepted. And if it's not, they are rejected. And I think for a lot of us, if we're honest, a lot of us actually carry that same level of performance-based anxiety into our relationship with God because we don't realize that we have been forgiven. Is that 20 minutes gone or 20 minutes left? Oh. Holy moly. <laughs> <laughs> Get comfortable. And I think that it's a massive challenge for us because it actually keeps us at a, a level of unrest that Jesus never wanted us to experience. Because when we are living performance-based lifestyles, when we're living for the approval of the people around us, it's actually exhausting. Because here's the thing, you can't please everyone and you never will. And actually, by allowing our guilt and our shame and our remorse and our embarrassment and our shortcomings and our failures to determine how we engage with other people, we're actually chasing after something that God never wanted us to chase after in the first place. Because he's given us forgiveness. But here's the thing. This belief system, it actually stands for our inability to accept and receive the forgiveness that Christ won for us on the cross. And it actually causes us to live in such a way that we actually assume that God made a contract with us rather than it being a covenant. And the thing about it is, is that God's forgiveness was not and is not determined by our ability to stick to the obligations of a contract. God's forgiveness was actually won for us on the cross as a result of a covenant that God made with his people. He says in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 33 and 34, this was the promise of God to God's people. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant though I was husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and, I will, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And our ability, hear me when I say this, okay? Our ability to receive forgiveness is deeply rooted in our understanding of who God is and what we believe about him. And probably, if not the most important question, certainly one of the most important questions that you will ever have to answer on your life and potentially answer on an ongoing continual basis is what do you actually believe about God? And so I ask myself, and this is not a word of a lie, I ask myself on a regular basis what I actually believe about God, his character, his nature, and his deity. And I have to actually question my own God theology quite a lot. Um, but I have a couple of fundamental non-negotiables, okay? And the first one is this, because these are the foundations to my faith. I can't comprehend, and you guys will have heard me say this before, I actually can't comprehend the world coming into existence by accident. Like, I can't look at you. I can't look at the beauty of Alan and Kelly and Ethel uh, and Linda. I, I can't look at the beauty of you and the complexity of your humanity and actually believe that that, that was an accident. Yeah. I, I can't comprehend it. There's too much going on for it, the uniformity and yet the diversity of our humanity for me to kind of get my head around that this was an accident. I believe in a creator God, I believe in a grand design, and I believe that you were created for purpose, with purpose and on purpose, and there's nothing that I have heard or seen that can shift me from that. It's fundamental to what I believe. The second thing is this, is that I believe with all of my heart that Jesus was and is the savior of the world. We as a, a church family have been invited and have watched the movie, The Case for Christ, right? 
And in the movie, The Case for Christ, or if you've ever read the book, The Case for, the, the, the Case for Christ, you will see and you will learn and hopefully appreciate the fact that Jesus definitely walked the earth, historically proven, that Jesus definitely went, went to a cross, historically proven, the tomb was empty, historically proven, so his existence cannot be contested, okay? So here's the thing, right? He was either one of these three things, if that's the case, he was either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord, okay? I can't comprehend the fact that for 2,000 years, humanity would, would allow a liar or a lunatic to shape how we live. And so, if I can't believe that he was a lunatic, and if I can't believe that he was a liar, then he must be Lord. And so it's a fundamental core belief that I have that Jesus Christ is Lord. <coughs> the third thing is this, okay? I am utterly convinced, because of everything that I have seen happen in my life and in the lives of those around me, that God is for me, that God loves me, that God is for us, and that God loves us. And there's nothing that anybody has ever been able to tell me or show me that would make me disbelieve those three fundamental things, okay? So because I've got that fundamental core belief, that's my God theology, if you like, okay? Because I am convinced of these things, I'm actually better positioned then to believe everything that God has said about me and written for me. Because if he's not a liar, I can believe his words. If he's Lord, I can believe in his love. So I believe what the Bible says. And if the Bible says that I am forgiven, if the Bible says that we are forgiven, because of everything that I believe about God, I can have the faith to believe that I am forgiven. And I think as a parent, I think as a, as a child, that I have seen the power that forgiveness can bring like I've got first-hand experience of what it means to, to give and receive forgiveness. Like as a child, God bless my parents. God loves them. Like seriously, like. I don't know how they didn't have a nervous breakdown. I'm not even joking. But God loves them. I was an absolute nightmare of a child. Nightmare of a child and I have robbed from them I have stolen from them I have manipulated them I have bullied them you will have heard me share the story about me pulling a knife on my dad like you name it I have done it and what would happen is that every time I would have done something like that I would I would have disappeared and sometimes I disappeared for months on end because I would allow the guilt and the shame of my actions to lead me and pull me away and lead me into isolation rather than actually seeking forgiveness and then allowing restoration to take place. But the beautiful thing about my mum and dad and what they've taught me as a, as a man, what they've taught me as a human being, uh, and what they've hopefully taught me as a, as a parent and hopefully all of my children know that they're loved and the home is safe, no matter what you do, None of, the, none of the rest of them here, but so I might know you. Like, no matter what you do, you know you've got a safe space and that you'll always be loved and there's forgiveness is freely available regardless of, of what it is. I mean, if you take my shoes, that's a whole other matter. But <laughs> the thing about it is, is that this is what was modeled to me as, 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 as a child. This is what I, I see happening right throughout Scripture. Like, we see right throughout the, the theme, the biblical narrative of the the, the, the story of God passionately pursuing humanity, his divinity passionately making a way for our broken humanity to be restored to wholeness and wellness with him. Um, it's, it's interwoven and it's intertwined right throughout all of the biblical narrative. You'll all be familiar with the, for the purpose of time I won't read it, but you'll all be very familiar with the story of the prodigal son. I am the prodigal son. We are the prodigal sons. But the thing about the prodigal son, you know, this is, so the prodigal son, the son wishes his dad dead, basically. That's, that's the heart of it. I wish you were dead so that I could get your money, right? 
and the dice will go not down, but you can have the money. And he goes off, and he goes off to Amsterdam in the 21st century, and he's <laughs> prostituting it up, and cocaine in it up, and partying it up, and, and living the life, and then he runs out of money, and then he actually realises that, oh dear, I can't actually sustain and live my life without my father, but I can't go back, because I've got the guilt, the shame, the remorse, um, my behaviour doesn't warrant my father's forgiveness. And somewhere, somehow, some way, he finds the the courage to go home. And when he goes home, he receives the, the father's forgiveness. The thing about it is, is that both sons, okay, both sons are massively challenged by the father's response. Both sons are in agreement that the prodigal son doesn't deserve to receive the father's forgiveness. But yet the father's desire to forgive his son and restore their relationship is overwhelming. In fact, it's a really beautiful picture of grace in action. And grace rarely makes sense, if we're honest. It's messy, it's unfair, um, and rarely, if ever, deserved. Like grace is unmerited favor. And I believe that our inability to accept and receive forgiveness is deeply rooted in our misunderstanding of grace. Equally, our ability to forgive is rooted in our ability to understand grace. The good news for us as the church today is this, is that the Bible teaches us that we cannot, tell me when I say this, we cannot out God's forgiveness. And we cannot outrun his goodness and mercy. It's always following us and it will be with us forever. But here's the thing. It actually takes great faith to receive that. And it takes great faith to receive forgiveness. And it takes even greater faith to live as a forgiven child of God. Believing in the grace of God is an act of faith that changes our lives if we allow it to. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says this, For it is by grace that you have been saved, and through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. So here's the thing, right? If we can have the faith to believe that God is who he says he is, then surely we can find the faith to believe that what he says he's done, he has done. I, my very limited understanding of forgiveness and my limited ability to accept and receive forgiveness actually has a huge impact on all of my interpersonal relationships. So it's no secret. Jenny, I love you. That's no secret either. But it's no secret that when Jenny and Mike had the affair, when Jenny was pregnant, that I was massively hurt. I was massively grieved. I was massively disappointed. And again, hear me when I say this, I was not without fault. I let Jenny down. I wasn't able to love her in the way that she needed to be loved after the, um, the, the, the death of their mother. But I was angry, I was bitter, I was resentful. And, and I, for the longest um, time, the last thing that was on my mind was forgiveness. I was grieving the loss of our relationship. I resented the impact that it would have on the kids and I wished her dead. I'm not even gonna lie. It's quite funny that it's very easy, okay? It's very easy for us to be the people of truth when we have been grieved. And it's actually quite difficult for us to be people of grace when we have been grieved. But yet we all want to be forgiven but we find it so difficult to forgive. And what I've learned through my relationship with Jenny and the impact of both of our behaviors on each other is that when you know you're forgiven, when you can say that I am forgiven, you can actually say I forgive you. Let me just say that again. When you know that you are forgiven, when you can say I am forgiven, it actually positions you to be able to look someone in the eye and say I forgive you. And that's a really beautiful, powerful thing and so when Jenny and I, remember that night in Key West, Jenny? So we had been going to the same church together. We had been um, in the same social circles together. Very difficult, um, very challenging. We made people feel uncomfortable because we were uncomfortable. It was a nightmare for, for other people. And we kind of had this chat and we said, hey, do you know what, we need to do something about this. We needed to address the fact that our uncomfortableness with each other was making other people feel uncomfortable. And so 
I can't remember who extended the invitation. I'm going to say it was me because I'm not that good. Okay, thanks, Jimmy. Jimmy said it was me. So I extended the, 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 the olive branch, the invitation. Hey, let's, do, let's go out for something to eat. Let's have a coffee. Let's do something together <coughs> um, where maybe we can just begin to learn how to parent our children better together, make people not feel uncomfortable in our company together, and actually be Christ followers and, um, and love each other. Not in the sense of pursuing a relationship with each other because we hadn't been together for a long time and we had both been pursuing other relationships. Jenny was visiting other churches, hoping that she would get to use the wedding dress that she bought to, mar to marry me or somebody else. But you know, that's okay. And again, I say that I'm not without fault and I'm not saying this to make Jenny look bad. It just sounds funny when I say it from the mic with a microphone. And, um, but here's the thing, right? We both... I think it's fair to say, Jenny, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we both arrived at Key West restaurant that night, terrified? Yeah? Nervous. Okay, nervous, okay. I was terrified, okay. And it very much felt like we were walking into the lion's den for me. I had been so hurt, as you all hear, and I was not without fault, and I hurt Jenny in many other ways. And if she gets the microphone, she can tell you about all of those things. Um, because I was not a nice person and I, she needed to be punished. And I made sure she was punished by how I behaved. But there was something quite miraculous happened over the course of a three course dinner mm -hmm. that to this day blows my mind. It was a miracle. An absolute, I would say out of all of the things that I have seen God do in countless people's lives, it's the greatest miracle I've ever seen. Because I know how hard my heart was. I know how upset and angry I was. I also know how awful I was to Jenny in the build up to that season. And yet I walked in terrified and I walked in as, as we walked in as enemies. And over the course of a three-course dinner, we left as the future Mr. and Mrs. Shields. You see, when you know that you're forgiven, it's easier to say, I forgive you. Colossians chapter 1, verses 22, sorry, 21 and 22 says this. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds of your evil behavior because he has now reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy and blameless in his sight without blemish and, and free from accusation. We were enemies from God. The King of Kings the Lord of Lords, the great I am, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, who was and is and is to come, actually looks at you and he says, hey, it doesn't matter what you've done, there's forgiveness for it. It doesn't matter what you've done, you don't need to be punished for it, because actually Jesus took all of the punishment on the cross, so you're forgiven. And so God can look at us in his perfect sovereign deity and say, I forgive you. Surely we as his children, as the people of God, can look at each other and say, I forgive you. Because when you know that you have been forgiven, when you can say, I am forgiven, you can look at your neighbor and say, I forgive you. And we need to, if we can, in, in some way, put our pride away, actually find compassion and humility, not just for ourselves, but for others as well, in such a way that we can be a forgiving people. And so you guys, I'm sure at this stage, are sick to the teeth hearing me talk about my five R's. Kelly, you will not have heard this before, so every day I do five things that allow me to be a better husband, father, disciple, that start with a letter R. The first one is this, I wake up every morning 
with my morning coffee and I recognize how I'm feeling. And I pray this prayer. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. And you know more often than not, the thing that I have to carry to the cross, because the next thing that I do is I have communion, daily communion, where I remember what Christ has won for me on the cross. More often than not, the thing that I have to carry to the cross after that point of recognition is unforgiveness that I'm carrying in my heart. Jenny came home, well this, this was an old one that used to come up regularly. Jenny would come home from work and go straight up the stairs and not say hello. I wouldn't, want to, I wouldn't have wanted to say hello to me at that stage either, by the way, but it used to really frustrate me. And I used to get up the next morning and still be angry about it. And think, actually, I'm carrying unforgiveness. So what do I need to do? I need to bring that to the cross. And sometimes this process of forgiving, it doesn't actually happen overnight. It's a process. But the good news is this, is that God has actually given us a pathway that allows us to forgive each other. Christina, was that fair or 40? Okay, I'm going to stop there because you guys have listened for way too long. Um, can we get the worship team back up? Okay? And here's the thing. Here's what we're going to do, right? It's always good to have a response element to these things. Thank you so much for your patience this morning, guys. I hope it's been helpful and that you're encouraged. Yeah. Um, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray this prayer with me, okay? <coughs> Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Now just sit on that for a moment, if that's okay. Jenny's going to play and the guys are going to start singing in a moment. But just rest, just sit, sit with that for a minute, okay? And really allow God to search you and to reveal to you an area of unforgiveness in your heart right now. And a beautiful thing is this, that we're going to sing about forgiveness and we are forgiven. And as we know that we are forgiven, we can say, I forgive you. Actually, you'll be equipped to bring forgiveness into the relationship that you're trying on forgiveness in right now. So we want it to be practical, we want it to be life-giving, we want it to be life-changing. But it all starts at the cross. So what are you going to bring to the cross today? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life.
thank you, Lord, for the cross. Yeah. We thank you that on the cross that you brought forgiveness. Yeah. Jesus, you're so good to us. Yeah, we just worship you, Lord. <coughs> I just want to pray, Lord, that for anyone that might be in here this morning or watching online, that they would know, not just in their head, but in their heart, that they are forgiven. And what that means is the stain that that sin has caused has been completely washed away. So, Lord, just help with your Holy Spirit, Lord people that need to accept forgiveness, to accept forgiveness. The, nearly the hardest forgiveness that we can experience is forgiving ourselves. So Lord, I just pray, Father, that you would just help us to forgive what needs to be forgiven, Lord. Help us to not hold grudges. Help us to walk in love and mercy and grace. And we just thank you that all those qualities, Lord, follow us from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Guys, have a wonderful day.